Hello, everyone. It's Catherine Norland. And uh, I was having a little technical difficulty trying to get my guest on. So we're just, it's eight o'clock and I wanted to start promptly, but um, I think I may have sent her the wrong link. So we're getting that ironed out right now. I am excited though. Today we're going to be talking about aggressive optimism and how does that, how does that help you in life get over some of the hard stuff you're going through and how can we apply it to what, you know, what we're going through. You maybe saw, if you're on the YouTube link, you maybe saw um, like the subtitle or the description to hang on to this when everything is falling apart. So that is what we're going to be discussing. And I have the best selling author that is supposed to be on with us today. Ah, I think she just joined us. <laughs> so I'm going to add her to the stage now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Send us here. I think it's my fault. I sent her the wrong link. I had did it wrong and, you know, technical stuff. We, we were very okay. good. <laughs> so, everyone, this is my dear friend, Jenna. And um, you know what? I think this is worthy. I normally go live on, on Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so right now we're live on in my private Facebook group. We're live on LinkedIn and we're live on YouTube. And oh my know, gosh! Look at yeah, you I, with all the. I, all the I normally things. put up my phone and I do Instagram at the same time too, but then they won't see you. So ah. I would have had to warn you in advance. You'll be on your computer for this one, and then we'll do it again on our phone. That's just uh, they'll just have to miss out. What can we say? Yeah. We can next we can, time them will lead them to this link later so everyone i did the my formal introduction this is my dear friend jenna she was one of the first people i met at an audition probably within months i think of moving to hollywood yeah i think you said you were here for like two months okay so you're probably my longest friend in hollywood <laughs> <laughs> And we were on the same kind of career path for a while. And then something happened and it careened you kind of out of it and into a different yeah. place. And that's, you know, part of what we're going to be talking about today. So Jenna is a best-selling author of her new book, Aggressive Optimism. And uh, I think that's something a lot of us could use. <laughs> so... Let's get into that now. Do you have your book that you can hold up and show people? Oh my people? gosh, look at me. I forgot to grab it. Hold, please. Sorry, y'all. Right here. Don't worry. I'll be back in two seconds. I'm sitting here thinking, oh goodness. Oh goodness. Okay. There it is. Aggressive optimism. This is bright yellow. So, so I just, I want to get right into this because I think maybe there's some people on here that are, maybe they don't understand what that means or how they can apply that to their life. and um, Or how it's very different from toxic positivity. Yeah. You know what? I, that is a good point. I've been, uh, there's a, somebody I know, I went to her retreat last June and she's got a book out. And one of the things in her subtitles is like talking about toxic positivity and I been seeing that buzzword go around a lot and I just don't like it. So please tell us what the difference is. Like, I was like, how could positivity be toxic? What? <laughs> so I think, oh, that's a great segue, right? Like you think positivity, 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 yeah. but it gets toxic when you um, deny that there's actual issues. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So it's like you're constantly trying to convince yourself that everything is fine, that you should look at the bright side and and all of that. And I agree most of the time that that mm -hmm. is the absolute path you should take unless something like uh, what I write about in the book, which is based on my own story, but I made it fictional. So the main character, her name is Nif, and she goes through this horrific um car crash that like causes ptsd which you know more than most um is what i went through and being toxically positive or being in what i call denial 
um, nearly killed me because I wasn't able to acknowledge just how severe my trauma was and I wasn't able to um, sort of allow myself permission to get the help that I needed because of that. And so that's where toxic positivity comes in. And I think there's a lot of it now because you have, you know, five seconds on an Instagram post to give someone encouragement, not mm -hmm. realizing that some people might take that and think that they're not doing a good job because they're having a bad day, you know, mm -hmm. or like in my case, the PTSD was full on chemical, physical, like emotional trauma that needed medical help. Um, and so I think that's the difference, right? For me, mm -hmm. aggressive optimism is like the yes and game in improv, mm -hmm. where you can't move forward until you acknowledge where you are. Like you mm -hmm. have to be like, you know what, right now I'm broken. Yes. And there are many, many ways for me to become healed. And so there's this point where, and that's the aggressive part is like, just being aggressively honest with yourself, aggressively like holding on to the belief that things can get better, but only if you acknowledge that they're not where you want them to be right now. Yeah. Acceptance goes a long way. And when I've talked about that with some of my coaching clients before, they were like, I can't accept this. I can't just accept it. I said, well, if you don't accept that it's happened, you can't really move on and heal. You can't pretend that it didn't happen. Yeah. So what's That's interesting? What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no. Go ahead. Were you going to say something? I was going to say, I would... I think that that's a terminology thing, right? Like it's how we, how do we define acceptance? Because yeah. I, in a lot of people, acceptance means um, agree staying it. put, like this is just the way it is, you know, where acknowledgement is like looking at the thing, acknowledging that it's there, but then also having that action piece of moving forward. So I wonder if that's maybe the, Mm hmm. The like, um, what do you call it? He not hesitation the point for some people is in the language. And you and I have had yeah. many discussions about this over the years where it you would be doing a certain thing and we would label it like, oh, you're a thought leader. No, I'm not. Nope. I'm <laughs> like, no, you know, and it's like, but that's I've accepted that <laughs> term now, by the now way, Catherine. <laughs> But do you know what I mean? Like sometimes yes. we have an idea of what that means and then mm -hmm. we don't want to, like, we somehow don't want to take that on. Yes. So I was like, that's too much responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, it's, you know, it's, it's been given to you and you're allowed. You're allowed. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Where'd you go? Hi. Did we lose you? Catherine. Uh-oh. Hi, y'all. I'll just keep talking. I don't know what happened. Like, where, <laughs> where'd she go? I have aggressive optimism that I'm going to get back on the live and no one's going right. to notice anything happened. So I was just saying was, hi while you were gone. It's totally fine. It's wonderful. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes it is the language that can hold us back. And mm -hmm. so you were dealing with PTSD and and you you wrote this story and I know this is this is a story that's been you've been wanting to write about this book for like you've been wanting to write aggressive optimism not knowing that's what it would be called for like yes. 20 years right yeah since since the crash which was oh. yeah 20 years ago um so yeah it's interesting right because it took me a really long time I feel like obviously part of my journey was to be able to heal and talk about it without that emotion that yeah. was, um, you know, still flooding through for years and years and years afterwards. Um, yeah. But I, it was also, and I, I want to say this to anybody listening who might feel like they're stuck because they're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, I wanted to tell 
the story as a fiction for a really long time. And it's because, you know, I came to Los Angeles like you to be an actor and we, and you know, I love the entertainment industry. I love entertaining people. I feel like there's so much value in what I call like spoonful of sugar type of content where you're like putting a message into a really engaging story. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that. And I also wanted to do it because, you know, there's three sides to every story. And the things that I went through were potentially offensive to some of the people involved. Because when I had post-traumatic stress disorder, and I talk about this in the book with NIF as well, it's like I was one of – it wasn't a common diagnosis at the time. It was very much reserved for military. And Mm -hmm. so – the people that were treating me really didn't understand um, what I was going through, obviously my family and friends, and how could they? Like you can't expect right. people to understand what's going through your your mind and what you're going through. And I had no idea what I was going through. And so there's a lot of um, things that I talk about in there. I'm really open with NIF's inner dialogue. Like it, yeah. I wanted people to understand what it was like to go through flashbacks and panic attacks and not be able to like get your body and mind under control, even Mm -hmm. though you're trying your darndest to make it happen. Right. So for me, it was like, I wanted to express the emotions and I, I kept getting caught up on the facts when people would say to me, right. Like you should write this as a nonfiction. You should be a coach. You should do this. Like you went through that whole journey with me. And I was like, I just want to tell the story so that it will resonate emotionally with the reader so that they Mm -hmm. can feel like they're not alone instead of comparing the, you know, the truth, if you will. Um, And I think I accomplished that, but it took me a long time. And my point in saying this is I battled with the format of this book probably more than the story. Oh, interesting. As I'm, you know. I'm, I'm relating to you in some ways. I, I and and we usually when we get together, we're not we're usually talking about all the positive things. So we're not usually talking about what we're battling with. But you know, as I, you know, I'm seeing you do this and finally publishing the book, um, and I have since dealt with since you had this thing happen. I have come to terms with having dealt with a little bit of PTSD from the, my children's premature births and them almost dying and like all this stuff that went with it. So I too have been trying to like write this book for like 16 years. And every time I sit down to write it, I'm just like weeping and it's just like stuck in my chest. And so like, as I'm reading your stuff, I'm like, Oh, I kind of know what that feels like. And, um, I've, you know, I've tried to go to retreats. I've tried to talk to different people. I've tried, you know, the the thing, the think positive, the focus on something else. And just this week, I started working with. Uh, well, I guess I'm going to share this publicly now. I just started working with a hypnotherapist um, who deals with like um, traumatic birth situations, and so I've only had my first session. I have no like big results yet, but. What she does is she helps you remove kind of like the the charge. So the memories are still there, but the charge and the feeling of it gets released. And so I know in your journey, you also tried multiple different things in order to like get get yourself back or come back to mm-hmm. some kind of new form of normal. Would you want to share what some of those yeah. things that you tried absolutely. or absolutely absolutely and that to me is is the essence of aggressive optimism right like that belief that you'll find the thing that works i think mm-hmm. i love that you're talking about this right because you said 16 years for me mm-hmm. it was so many it's been 20 years since the this thing happened to me and just mm-hmm. this last year is when i finally um, felt confident in writing this book the way that I wanted to write it. And I always say there's a million ways to do anything. And through my journey of healing, 
holy man, I had to try like 60 different therapies. I think I did like 30 different medications to try and regulate my chemistry. I, you know, I ended up in the hospital. I went to so many different therapists until I found one that works. And I actually tell this story in the book of, um, and it's a true story, the first therapist. So when I was diagnosed with PTSD, I was in full denial, you know, but I also was a good girl who followed the rules and they were like, you have to go to therapy. And I'm like, okay, cool, but I'm fine. Like. I don't know why you guys are making such a big deal out of it, right? Never mind the fact that I was having three flashbacks a day that would make me pass out. I was having panic attacks. I didn't sleep for eight months. Like all this stuff is happening, but I am in like the most denial I've ever been in my entire life. But like the, you know, A plus student that I am, I went to this therapist and the whole time I'm having these like validation issues. Like I'm not a soldier. This type of thing doesn't happen to regular people you know what i mean and so mm -hmm. i'm in this therapist's office and she literally i'm like you guys i am crying like snot is coming out of my nose like i am in it describing you know everything that i saw that day and i look up and she is sleeping <laughs> When I read that, I was like, is that true? Did that really happen? Like, I had so many questions because it's kind of, in some ways, one of these things that we avoided talking about when we got together. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, did that really happen? Did that really yes. happen? Did that really happen? Yes. Oh so gosh. imagine, you think you're fine and you're making, uh, everyone, in, including you, is making a huge deal out of this thing. And then you go to a professional and they fall asleep. I was like, this is not good for my validation issues. Yeah, And I say that because if I had stopped there, I'd probably not be here. Do you know what I mean? Like it was so bad yeah. that yeah. if I hadn't continued to try and find a therapist and a therapy that worked for me, because we're yeah. all different, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have made it. And it's really important, I think, for everybody listening to be like, if you tried something and it didn't work, find something mm -hmm. else. Like the the yeah. optimistic journey is that commitment to figuring out what's gonna work for you mm -hmm. and take the judgment of all of it out of yourself as much as possible. Like, you know what I mean? It's like when you eat something and it upsets your stomach. Okay, we'll eat something that doesn't and then you find the thing that makes you feel mm -hmm. good. So. So um, for when you mentioned the yes and an improv, I think there's a lot of people who don't know what oh. that is. Uh, they're not actors. So yes. in, when, we, when you practice improvisation, that's when you don't have a script and there's no lines there. Someone from the audience or another cast member can just throw something out at you like, well, your leg is broken. And you always right. have to say yes. You have to say yes no matter what they throw at you. And then now your character's suddenly walking with a limp on stage because right. they told you your leg is broken. So it's yes and, and like what's next. So that's exactly. what she's talking about with the like aggressive optimism. It's like, okay, maybe my leg's broken and maybe my this happened and this happened. And you're walking around like a mess, but you're always waiting for the and and what's next. So when she talks about finding different forms of therapy, I know there's people on here who I've talked to who have been through certain forms of therapy and they, maybe they've tried two or three different things and they're like, and they're like, forget about it. It's not working clearly. Like no one's going to understand. I'm never going to get help. I'm going to be stuck this way. And, and you're here to tell us you may no. have to try 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 different things, but that's where the aggressive optimism comes into place. You don't give up. You keep looking forward to what is that thing going to be, be? Because we know, um, we know that that we don't have to stay stuck. We know that that whatever happens to us, it's not like a death sentence. It doesn't have to be for the rest of your life. And like you talk about in the book, aggressive optimism, um, they when they diagnosed you with PTSD, they told you it was for life. And mm -hmm. you ended up running into a buddy, a friend who had gotten over it and who had yeah. healed from it. So it that's 
I think that's something that also people need to look forward to. I know there's different people on who struggle with things and they think I've been dealing with this for 30 years. I'm stuck with it. But if you can find somebody who's gotten through it, who's beaten it, it's it, it gives you that hope. It gives you that optimism that, you know what, if they beat it, maybe I can beat it, too. And I don't have to listen to the doctors who say this is for life or this is the death sentence or that's you're just stuck with it. You can have that optimism to to reach for more and find more. Yes. Oh, I love that. I, and I also think it's important to remember um, that you never know where the tip or tool or trick might come from. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, in the book, I talk about, and this is absolutely a true story. So essentially, I went through eight months of not sleeping and I ended up in the psych ward because I ransacked my entire apartment trying to find a bottle of sleeping pills that I'd finally agreed to try. And um, and I had this moment of clarity where I was like, I'll take the entire bottle not because I want to die, but because I wanted to sleep so badly. And it felt like the only way to do that was to just take a whole bottle of pills. And so in that moment, I asked for help, thank goodness. And I ended up in the hospital. And for eight months before, in, in addition to not sleeping, I was having major flashbacks and panic attacks. And I know that you did a role with this tip in it, which I think is just so cool. Maybe you can pull out the clip and we can share it. But um, while I was in the hospital, I happened to have a panic attack next to a nurse that wasn't a psych ward nurse. She was a surgical nurse. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, here, put this ice pack on your neck. Y'all, I had been going through this for eight months. I had been in therapy three days a week. I mean, going through it, right? And this woman in one moment changed my entire life because mm -hmm. the trick is to put the ice pack on your neck. And she was like, people have panic attacks all the time before surgery. And this mm -hmm. is how you stop them. And so the, the ice freezes the adrenaline. And mm -hmm. then you remember, do you remember this? Then you drink something that will make you burp, kind of gross. But it gets that like um, gas out of your body so you can breathe and relax again. It works mm -hmm. like 99% of the time for me. And wow. even today, sometimes I'll get overwhelmed at work or I'll just be having a bad day. And I'm like, why, am I, why is my chest so tight? And then I mm -hmm. realize like I'm probably holding on to adrenaline that doesn't belong there because of all of the like daily pressure. Yeah. So I'll just do that little trick real quick at night and it, I feel better. So I think the key is like being open to trying different things, mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. how you roll. Like for me, I'm very logical. So once I started to understand that the, the therapies that were more about the emotion didn't work so well for me. For mm. me, it was more about like, how do we regulate your body chemistry? How do we, you know, like this trick is very specific, those types of things, because that's mm. just how I work, right? Mm. I know people where talk therapy works miracles for them, just yeah. not for me. So my other like really big idea that I want to get across is like, you have to understand how you work when you yeah. are well mm -hmm. and then find ways to get that type of treatment while you're not well mm. and remove the judgment because yeah. how you work may be different from how this person works and that's okay well not only that um like the amount of time it takes to heal like I should be over this by now. Why, why am I still dealing with this? So people are going to judge me. They're going to say, well, I can't. come on. It was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Why is deal? I remember four years, yeah. Timmy was like four or five and I decided to go to a poetry reading. And I was, I wrote this poem about him in the NICU and I don't, I think I was like three lines into it and I'm sobbing. I'm just like, I like forced myself to read through all the, I didn't, I felt embarrassed to just stop 
And after I got off the stage and I'm like a wreck, people are coming up to me like, oh my God, did he die? Did your son die? And I'm like, no, he's fine. And they're looking at me like, well, why are you like sobbing and crying like this if he's lived? <laughs> And I couldn't, I just felt so embarrassed and I felt I know. so ashamed. And then I kind of decided I wasn't going to talk about the NICU or the premature birth anymore. Cause like I should be over it. Cause it's, yeah. And, Cause it's clearly not as big a deal as I'm making it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, here's the thing that I've really come to realize and a book called the four agreements like solidified this. I don't even know what you want to call it, belief or whatever it is, but people who haven't done the work mm -hmm. have a really hard time handling people who have mm. or people who are doing it, right? Because you're shining a light on something they're denying. Mm. Yeah, and so when that happens, and this is why for me, sorry, I keep going off track. This is why for me, it's so important that we stop judging ourselves for mm -hmm. what we're going through. As long as we're progressing and making, taking the steps to find something that works for us, I feel like the judgment needs to go away because you're going to get it from the outside, right? Yeah. Like, and then we have to remember that those outside judgments have nothing to do with us. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's literally just that person doesn't know how to handle their own stuff. Yeah, and here you are being vulnerable and vulnerability makes people uncomfortable when they're in denial. But yeah, you're so you're so true. And I talk about this on my channel all the time that what people say about you says more about them than it does about you. And a lot of times they're they're just projecting. Okay. And so when you talk about doing the work, I, I don't know if people understand that terminology, mm. but He's talking about a lot of like the self care, like we like reading the books, taking the classes, doing the courses, finding the therapies, working on yourself, your journaling, you're trying to figure out. You know, most of them, most people do not do that. They instead they bury themselves in entertainment or in food or mm -hmm. in distractions because they don't want to deal with those feelings. But Absolutely. that's pushing it down. And it's like the beach ball that you shove underwater. The more you shove it down, the further you shove it down, eventually the more it's going to, to fly out. And that's why like last year I started to really like, I'm like, I really got to resolve this, this trauma I have around the, the NICU experience with both my kids. And so I was going to more things and talking about it and taking workshops and retreats. And now with the hypnotherapy, just because it's, it's, it's always going to be there. You can say, oh, I've forgotten about it, but it's always going to be there and it's going to pop up when you least expect it. It's like, it's like when someone dies and you can't control when something suddenly reminds you of them and you're, right. you're struck with these feelings because you haven't dealt with it. Well, and I also think you're struck with feelings, even if you have, it's mm -hmm. just, you have a toolbox that you can yeah. go to to help you not fall apart if when you're, you've done the work, you have a yeah, set of tools. exactly. Mm. And it's really interesting. I love this theory of a toolbox or the idea of a toolbox because mine is so full. And just a few years ago, actually, right before COVID hit, um, my husband and I took a cross country road trip, and part of that was really traumatizing for me. And I didn't really realize it until I got back. And I was like, I don't feel right. Right. Mm. So part of the work is that you get really good at identifying when you just don't feel right. <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Even if it's just slightly off. And mm. I think the commitment, the optimistic part of aggressive optimism is this commitment to growth and becoming or creating a life that you really want to live, not necessarily even becoming the person you want to be, but like living the way that you want to live. Meaning like, I want to wake up and I want to feel joy. Okay, great. What does that mean to me? And how do I do that on a regular basis? And what tools are in my toolbox to help me with that? So I wasn't feeling joyful and I knew I could at this moment, right before COVID, when I got back from this trip, and I sat and I realized like, 
A, the tools that I was trying to, that I was using weren't working in that moment because my situation was different. And B, I had to really sit down and go, okay, well, what tools do I think will work? And mm -hmm. what can I try, you know? And mm -hmm. so there will be times I feel like on our life journey where um, maybe our trauma is re-triggered like an old football injury, right? <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, and that's what happened to me. I was surrounded by all of this like noise and stimuli that I wasn't used to. And my body's nervous system just like couldn't handle it. So I was yeah. having a little bit of trauma for no reason that I could see mm -hmm. until I like slowed down and was like, okay, what's up, right? Like you have a lot of conversations with yourself when you're on a healing journey of like, all right, what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> like what's going on in our body and in our mind and what tools can we use to get us where we want to go? Um, so I just say that to say like, build your toolbox, you know, mm -hmm. experiment with like, and if you, if you like the idea of like a p artist kit, do that. Like what colors do you love to paint with? Do you like to use chalk? Do you like to use watercolor? Like, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm babbling now. <laughs> no, no. So um, I'm going to see if I can pull up that movie you were talking about. Um, let's see. Oh my gosh. Do you remember that? That was so cool. I was actually thinking about that because um, you, we consulted with you on uh -huh. how to handle the post-traumatic stress. Are you, um, can you guys see this screen? with a professional email? I can see it. I don't know. I can see it. Okay. <laughs> Your life all in one place. Secure so this are they chatting somewhere? Did, I love chatting. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, say that again. Are they chatting? Is your audience chatting oh, yes, somewhere? They are I... chatting. They are chatting. Oh. I will bring it. I will take a look at it and look at some of the questions. So this character <laughs> of mine had PTSD from an attack that she went through. Um, she was physically attacked and uh, she's having panic attacks. And let's see if we can show a clip from it. You guys want to look at this? So she's just doing the work. She's reading the book. She's PTSD. We had all these book covers designed. There's the ice pack, <laughs> ice pack on the neck, listening to CDs, oh listening to sermons. So, yeah, we don't need to go through the whole thing, but just to, we we met with Jenna Dad? to to see if we could. When are you coming home? I just finished. Oh, I think you muted, Katie. Cafe. Oh, I just stopped talking. It's getting dark, you know. So. Where's your mom? She had to take Dad to his doctor's appointment, and I didn't want to make her come all the way back. Okay, Gwen, listen to me. I want you to call Jenny right now and see if she can come over and stay with you. I tried. Baby's sick. And I'll be home just as soon as I can, I promise. She's taking her pills like a good girl. With the ice pack on her neck. Healing the key is healing that you have to sit down when you're back. There you go. <laughs> Sitting down with the ice pack, listening to a sermon to get me through. Get me through what I'm going through. send you forward. So anyway, you should share this. Yeah, go ahead. You should share this in the chat. The link. Okay. There you go. See, coming up with all the good ideas. So if you guys <laughs> want to check this film out later. I'm putting the link in the chat. It's called On the Fringe. <clears throat> Jenna was the consultant on that. Uh, on the Fringe. There we go. So different modalities work for different people. And you got to find out what works for you. Let me stop sharing mm -hmm. this screen. Um, you got to find out what works best for you. And not just because something works for somebody else doesn't mean it may work for you. <laughs> Cheryl's saying... You say you're babbling, but I would love to hear so much more. Let me look at some of the other comments. Let's see. <sighs> lots of that, lots of people on today, all basically saying hello. Hi. Uh, oh, where can you buy the book? Everywhere. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. <clears throat> yeah, Angela. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for being here. I know Angela's experienced a tough time lately with the uh, some losses in her life, so she was looking forward. To being here, um, <clears throat> what she's going through. 
So, um, yeah. So when it comes to, um, you know, I don't think people who are on here know what you experienced. So we've been talking about the PTSD. Mm -hmm. You talked about a crash. You're, and you've got your character who's got these big dreams, Niff, to get out of her small town <clears throat> and be, move to Hollywood and become a singer. And the day she's supposed to have this big, this big, you know, break. chance, this <laughs> opportunity, this big break to be on a TV show and sing, that's when this crash happens. Can you describe a little bit about it? Mm -hmm. So, um, <sighs> It's so meta because it's literally what happened to me, but I'm writing about it in the book and talking about it. With, it's just like so trippy. You guys. So basically she um, has a little bit of time before she's going to go perform on this like really popular TV show that, you know, she'll, she'll have an opportunity to share her voice and um, it's literally a dream come true for her. And she has a little bit of time before going into the studio and there's a farmer's market nearby. So she decides she's going to go buy her um, honey and uh, lemon for her tea so that she can, you know, take care of her voice. And she's just like living her dream. And this man drives his car through the farmer's market and, um, she where there's seen. not supposed to be cars. This is a walking path where pe yeah. people need to like understand how crazy out of sorts this is. That somebody is yeah. now driving down where people are walking. Yes, exactly. Um, and so Niff sees three people pass in front of her. And one of them is the man standing right next to her. And she... She makes it, but like that trauma, just seeing all of that thing, all of those things uh, causes this severe post-traumatic stress disorder. And in the book, so there's a trigger warning, be aware. It's it, I go into some detail about mm -hmm. what it's like in that crash, in her mind, in her, you know, all of the events afterwards, which are even more traumatic you know, because there are people who are telling her she should get over it. And, um, you know, they're saying things like, well, so-and-so went through this. And so on top of, you know, what she actually experienced and saw that her brain is trying to process, she's now, you know, seeing like plane crashes and other people's car crashes and all of this kind of stuff. And so I, I feel like PTSD and trauma is very much like a broken bone, right? I like to, and I talk about that in the book too. I feel like the book is very much, and Catherine, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's very much an <clears throat> internal, like you're going to understand what it's like for NIF to go through all of the things that she's going through. Um, so I wrote it in the hopes that people who are going through trauma have like a character that they can relate to that isn't a real human because that's a lot of pressure for the real humans, you know, like it's a it's a character um, that they can relate to and get inspiration from. But almost equally as important, I wrote it in a way that those who have family and friends that are going through trauma um, can understand what that person's going through. Right. Because when I went through it, one of the biggest things was I couldn't explain it. You know, like you're going through this thing that is completely new to everyone around you most of the time. And it's new to you too. So how do you find the words? So mm -hmm. my hope is that not only people who can relate to NIF, but their family and friends as well will read the book and have a better understanding of like what it's like to experience PTSD and trauma and healing and all of that. So I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, mm -hmm. but um, it's basically, yes. Yeah. So in a nutshell, 
um, she goes through this crash where an older man drives down a farmer's market, kills some people, injures some other people, and she sees things that she never thought she would have to deal with in her life. Yeah. And then the book is a lot of how. How do you deal mm-hmm. with that kind of thing and heal? Mm-hmm. Deal and heal. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a it was a surreal circumstance, as you mentioned, like you, something you thought you'd only see in a movie and not have to see in real life, um, the gore of, you know, what, what you saw. And, um, and in that moment and in those moments after, you know, there's still, you, you, you still went through a lot of, at least the character Nif, like, I'm just going to get over this. This is going to, this will, everything will be fine tomorrow. Like, this is not like, it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be great. It's going to be no problem. And, and you came to realize things suddenly your, your brain wasn't working the way it was. You got, suddenly mm. you had panic attacks, whereas you never had panic attacks before. You didn't even know what was happening mm. to you. How are you able to navigate all these changes in, in your, in your brain and your body and it not cooperating? Cause there's this point where you where you and your character Nif are, thinking, well, I'm just going to snap myself out of it. I'm just, things are just going to be back to normal. And then you're like, what is happening to me? Was that like an out-of-body experience? How how freaked out were you when you couldn't even read or understand or even know what was going on? Yeah, pretty freaked out. <laughs> I mean, I think that's why I really... <laughs> it was really scary right like you suddenly don't have control and i and of course nif um the character we're not criers we were never emotional people like we were we were very like solid in our behavior and a plus students and we did the things and were never problems like we were never the the problem children if you will and um so it's a it was a really like frustrating i think is probably the best word because you're like i used to be able to do this five minutes ago yeah right or like yeah. last week i was reading you know five books a week and now i can't read a paragraph Mm -hmm. Or I was able to get up and perform in front of, you know, the entire school. And now I can't remember the word salt. Like Mm -hmm. there's all of these moments where you're like, I don't understand what's going on. And so for me and Nif, we start to um, explore this idea of treating mental trauma like physical Mm -hmm. trauma. Right. Like once I started to understand that my brain broke like a broken leg. So Mm -hmm. I've always kind of looked at PTSD as two forms. You've got osteoporosis, which is like long term abuse type trauma where it builds up, but it's still debilitating at a certain point. But because it's building up, you don't really realize how Like all of a sudden one day you're, you know, you can't bend your knee. Like one day you can't hold it together. And that's trauma on, on a different level. For me, it was a NIF. It was like a bone broke. There was Mm -hmm. an incident that we could identify. There's clearly something wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And so once I started to look at my PTSD in that way, I was like, okay, if I had a broken bone, I wouldn't walk on it and deny it, which is what I had been doing Mm -hmm. for a really long time until I got into the hospital. And I talk about this in the book. Um, I met somebody who looked at her bipolar disorder very logically. Mm. And she was a great example to me and Nif on like, oh, it's just how my brain works. Here are mm. the things I have to do to, you know, make it so I can function at the level I want to function. Great. And so I started to think like, okay, if I had broken my bone, I would have gone to the doctor. They would have said it. They would have put it in a cast. Then I would have probably had physical therapy. 
So why am I treating my mental injury any differently? Yeah. You know, That's and it point. removed emotion from it, right? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, of course your brain isn't going to work the same as it did a week ago. You just broke it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think the, the interesting thing is like nobody bats an eye if you broke your leg and go get help. But for some reason, there's this, this shame around if your brain yeah. suddenly like people go, oh, they're 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 now a mental case or they're like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. if they'll, And there's this weird shame around. It. And that's why one of the things that, that I loved in your book was when you came back to school and you tried to get the school to talk about mental health issues even before you were totally healed. And I, I mm -hmm. want to bring that up because I think so many of us have gone through something. We're not totally healed, but we want to help people. But we think, well, I'm not qualified because I'm not fixed yet. But, you know, bringing up the topic and bringing awareness to whatever the subject is that you that you feel passionate about helping people with, that's possible to do even before you've got it all figured out. Sometimes it's just as simple as starting the conversation to help take the stigma away from what it is that you're dealing with. Absolutely. I, I love that you just used the word stigma. You know, it's really interesting because I actually lost a friend because mm. of that exact thing when mm. i um so mm. for me i started to realize part of the the thing that was making my flashbacks and panic attacks so intense was that while i was having them so basically when i was going through flashbacks it was like i could see and hear everyone around me but i was back at the crash and so i couldn't get to them to tell them i was okay Right. And so if all of a sudden we're walking on the street or walking down the street, having a great time and a fire engine drives by, I would be on the ground like freaking out. And so what I realized was if I tell people this is a possibility, if it happens, don't worry, here's what's going on. It made my anxiety of traumatizing the person I was with less so that mm. I could get mm. through the flashbacks quicker. Mm. And so the more I started yeah. to talk about it, not in a like, oh, woe is me, this is happening to me, but more in a logical, again, I know myself I'm very logical, in a very logical way, Catherine, we're going to go walk on the street outside. Here's the deal. This might happen. If it does, I just want you to be prepared because it was this added guilt for me yeah. of traumatizing somebody else because yeah. of my trauma, right? And so mm -hmm. I remember I started doing that and I started to feel better. And that's what that story is based on in the book yeah. where I was like, okay, well, this really helped me. Um, I had a friend call me and she was like, why are you telling everybody this? Because a, another friend of ours had heard or, or I had gone to like lunch with her anyway, it's a whole thing. And I was like, why do you care? Like, why do you care? She's like, well, you're better than that. You don't need people to feel sorry for you, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's not what this is, right? Like, this is not me telling people because I feel sorry for myself, which by the way, going back to that was 100% on her. That had nothing to do with me. But of course, mm -hmm. when you're hearing it at the time, you feel yeah. awful. Like, yeah. am I making this up? Am I doing, you know? But mm -hmm. everybody I told appreciated mm -hmm. it. And yeah. it wasn't like it became the conversation that we were going to now talk about all of my trauma. It was just like, hey, heads up. I'm allergic to peanuts. Yeah. You know, it's that kind of energy. And so... um. I really just, I love that you gave me the opportunity to talk about that because it really did start to take that extra worry and anxiety about the people around me out of the equation so that I could start to heal. Yeah. One of the things I remember from that time is um, not only so many things becoming difficult for you, but I remember we were going somewhere one day and 
just the the panic you just freaking out of like you couldn't even be like if i was driving you couldn't like in the car like you were so like terrified like am i am i slow down like look like you were so panicked that we couldn't even like i'm I was, so like, sorry I, i'm like am i driving wrong am i not a cautious driver because everything was like it was very hard for you to take the passenger seat and not be in control yeah so can you maybe explain for someone who there's people on here that maybe have some control issues because of traumatic experience that they've been through, that they felt helpless. They felt like they're not in control. H how do you move from like kind of letting go of that, that trust or that need to have to have everything figured out in control when there's other people we're dealing with and we can't control what they do. How did you like kind of get over, navigate through that? Oh my gosh. First of all, I'm so sorry. I don't even remember that experience, but it makes sense. Uh, you're not a bad driver. Again, that's on me, right? And that's going back to what you're saying. Like, it's so important to have these conversations in a very logical way, right? So mm -hmm. the thing with trauma and PTSD especially is, like, if you have any kind of control or OCD issues, oh, let me just tell you, they will come up. Right. And the reason is because you have no control over your brain. Hmm. Like the thoughts that are going in your head, they're not in your control right now. Right. So like for me, mantras and um, accolades and like journaling and all of those traditional ways of treating um, funks, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely didn't work because I didn't, my brain just could not comprehend the normal, regular things in life, right? And so when you're going through something that is so out of your control and you have a little bit of control issues, I'm not going to lie, I've always <laughs> been a control freak. Um, <laughs> It's heightened, right? Like you're going to want to control every single thing that you possibly can. So in mm -hmm. the book, I write this story, and this is a true story. When I was in the psych ward, there was, um, and so Niff in the psych ward was, uh, she had this blanket that her mom made for her, and it had horses on it. Do you remember this story from the book? Tell it. <laughs> it had Tell horses it. on it. And the cleaning person in the on the floor was so sweet right and she would come in and i would be in group therapy which didn't work for me by the way so if you feel guilty about group therapy not working for you let me tell you not a good situation for this girl anyway mm -hmm. i digress so i'm in group therapy and i would come back to my room and she would have made my bed which is like again so sweet but she made the bl she put the blanket on with the horses running upside down Oh my God. I literally, the first day she did it, I of course was just like, oh, uh, and I had to remake the bed. But I'm not kidding when I say she started to do it every day and I would leave. I would excuse myself and say, I have to go to the bathroom and I would go back to the room and make the bed again because I couldn't focus on group therapy mm. knowing this thing like the horses are running upside down, you guys. It's the most ridiculous thing, but that's the kind of stuff that happens when you go through trauma like this. Like you have to control something. Yeah. And so you're, it's going, it's most likely going to happen and it's going to feel completely ridiculous because you know, logically, it's completely ridiculous. But the more you lean into just understanding that it won't be forever, yeah, I think is the easiest best way to move through it right because yeah. what we resist persists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what we focus on grows and so if you're focused on this belief that it's going to get better i just need to keep moving forward that will grow but yeah i'm sorry again sorry no this, it's all good it's it's just it was just part of you know part of what you had to go through to get you know, to get back into some normalcy, get back. I mean, we, we go through things and things tr like I would go to, 
the grocery store, like when my son was in the NICU and I would see moms with their healthy babies and I would get angry. Mm -hmm. I would get like pissed off. Oh, they have a healthy kid. I had a friend who was doing drugs and she had a healthy kid. And I was like, this person who's sleeping around and is a drug addict has a healthy normal term baby. And I, you know, I didn't like want to have those angry feelings towards people and be jealous yeah. and whatever, but that's what was coming up for me. Like, I wasn't like, Oh, that's awesome that you did everything wrong. And still it turned out <laughs> for you when I was you right. know, doing everything right. So, you know, it's no, just that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. It is that kind of thing. And I think once you get through it, you start to realize that as much as it sucks, it's part of life, right? Like that's the growth journey. And I also think two things. One, I wanted to comment on, um, well, first of all, I want to say, I'm so sorry that you were going through that. That's just, it's horrible, right? And also you got through it. Kudos to you. It's really cool. It's really cool. Um, but going back to like when you said, when I apologized and then you're like, that's, that's what we go through in the book. I really wanted to highlight like the amazing friends, like the friendships, there's two friendships in there, but they're really based on probably like 30 friendships yeah. <laughs> that I have. I mean, obviously you're one of them, right? Like these groups, these friends that I have that NIF also has in there being so open and understanding and communicative and non-judging and all of those like not making it about them mm -hmm. I think you were one of those people and I feel like so honored and grateful to have people like that in my life and I feel like um it's just really important that anybody listening understands that friendships like that exist. And if you don't have friendships like that, they're out there, go create them. And um, it will change your life, right? Like if yeah. I had gone through this experience while I was still like hanging out with people who weren't on a growth path, Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have made it. Mm -hmm. that was, and I uh, think it's really, question. yeah. Oh, sorry. One of the questions I had wanted to ask you is I know there's some people on who, who maybe don't have the support system or the family or the friends that you have. And someone uh, just made a comment, Donald made a comment that uh, he's glad you had people who were there for you, but he didn't when he was going through it. And I know there's other people on here who are going through stuff and they don't have the support system. So what, what would you tell them? I know you said go out and create it. How would they go about creating these type of friendships? As you know, the difficulty of being in a small town is there's a lot of small minded people. <laughs> we we love you. It's okay. Yes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So a couple of things going back to your story in the supermarket. I think the first step to creating those types of relationships is to create it with yourself. And I know that sounds really strange, right? But when you were talking about like looking at this mom that had a healthy baby and your friend and all of that, I'm like, there's com comparison is poison. Yeah. And I think we have to start really understanding, obviously we're human, right? So we're going to compare. I do it all the time. It's just an automatic reflex, but becoming very aware when those things start to happen. Mm -hmm. Basically, I feel like healing is just awareness. How mm -hmm. do you operate? What do you want your life to look like? What is going on now? Like all of these things, not comparing to other people, but also so important, y'all, not comparing yourself to how you were yesterday. Yes. How Huge. you were five minutes ago, you know, like it's crucial. So in creating the relationships, 
I feel like once you start to create that relationship with yourself and trust that you are enough to support, like, I love the, I love the idea. And I think it was with you that we were at Brendan Bruchard's conference where he said, confidence is just your belief in your ability to figure it out. Mm. Like we have to start building up that belief in ourselves. We have to mm-hmm. start to understand that we are our own best friend mm-hmm. and looking at like, what do I actually need? So a great mm-hmm. example of this is, and I talk about this in the book, it is important that you talk to people about your trauma who understand trauma, mm-hmm. right? So it is most likely going to be a professional because it's yeah. not fair to put that kind of thing on a friend who maybe doesn't understand what's going on, right? So yeah, I think, I think people who deal, oh, sorry, go people who deal with addiction, this just came to my mind. You're trying to tell someone about your addiction and they've never been addicted to anything. And they're like, why don't you just stop doing it? It's, you know, yeah. it's not good for you. Just stop it. <laughs> oh my gosh. A joke that I have, cause I also deal with depression quite often, right? It's <laughs> Craig will do, Craig's my husband and it's totally a joke. He's like, do you ever try not being depressed? Yeah. 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 And you're like, try what? Not. Not what information like wouldn't that be great so i think it's really important that we understand we can handle the things that we need to handle and be our own support system first Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. because it's just like they always say you can't love anyone else until you love yourself Mm -hmm. i think it absolutely applies to that friendship circle that support system like if you're in a place where you don't understand how to deal with your own trauma, you need to start with professionals Mm -hmm. and they will help you build that support system so that when you do start to invite people, and it's really important to think about that. When you invite people into your friend circle, you are basically able to go, I don't think that person will be a right fit for this conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? And, can't tell everything to everybody. Don't tell everything to everybody. I know it's so hard, right? And so um, I think this is a, a piece of aggressive optimism too, is like, we have to believe that we will attract the kind of people that will be the support system we need, you know? And in the book, this is like based on 20 years of creating this friend circle that I have put into two characters, right? Mm -hmm. But there's key moments where like, we've built up this ability to communicate with each other. And there's this love and respect that I think is magical (laughs) to be totally honest with you, but it was work. And the work yeah. starts with you. It's self-work first. So uh, Brittany okay. is asking, um, Brittany is asking, what finally helped you with your sleep? I have major sleep mm. issues and so many people do not get how horrifying that can be. Oh my gosh. I'm sending you the biggest hug. Okay. A couple of things. One. Um, so for me, one of the things that really helped me, and I say this all the time, and Catherine will laugh at me, is Alias, the TV show, saved my life. <laughs> Gotta love some Jennifer I know that Garner. sounds so weird. Jennifer Garner, get it done. It. No, but for real. So when I was going through it, that was one of my favorite shows. And it did two things. One, super empowering character that I could see and start to, like, pull character traits out of. Two, um when I was going to therapy, they were like, you have to create a routine. You have to, if you are having sleep issues, you must create a routine so that your body knows like it's triggered to start to sleep. Y'all, my nightly routine is three hours. Wow. It's crazy long, right? Even but to, it, even to this day? Mm-hmm. Okay. Not yeah. just for that. I want to get, 
I know. If I want to get a full night's sleep, it is a good three hours, right? I wash my face, I brush my teeth, like first thing, right? I sit on the couch with my husband. He rubs my feet because he's the greatest human ever. And just that physical contact makes my nervous system calm down. So this is what I'm saying about like understanding how you work. Like it's not for me, the feet rub is not like a luxury. It's a, it's a medical physical, like I need to calm my nervous system down. Okay. Um, I am on a sleeping medication recently again, because I, I wasn't on it for God, I want to say a decade, but recently my life has become so different and different stimulus that I, I decided to go back on it. Great decision for me, right? I know medication is a touchy subject, um, but you've got to do what's right for you. So mm -hmm. I'll take my, I have to take my sleeping pill two hours before I go to bed or it doesn't kick in. Then, then I watch an hour of TV, usually something I've seen 30 times because it's like my comfort blanket. <laughs> and then, um, and then I go to bed and Craig tucks me in because he's a night owl. So he'll stay up and I'm a morning person. So I wake up at like five and then I wake him up and he tucks me in. So it's a whole thing that we've worked out, but it's really important to have a routine. Mm -hmm. It's extremely important not to judge yourself because mm -hmm. that judgment becomes anxiety that will make it so you don't sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I know for a lot of people, journaling really helps. There was a point where my sleep routine was a little bit different and I would write my to-do list for the next day because that was the thing that I was the most worried about. Mm -hmm. So like sitting with yourself and going, what is causing the anxiety? And then being like, is there anything I can do about it? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important question in general. You yeah. know, is there anything I can do about it? Great. If there is, go do the thing. Yeah. If there isn't, you have to figure out how to let it go. And that's going to be different for everybody. I hope yeah, that helps. Really Releasing the things that you can't control. It's like the serenity prayer, right? And Alcoholics Anonymous. It's give yeah, me the I grace to like do the things that I can do, but then the wisdom to know the difference. Like if, if yeah. you can't do anything about it, it's no productive value to worry about it. And if you don't have someone to rub your feet, maybe you get a foot bath. Maybe you're, you're putting on yeah. your essential oils on the diffuser that calm, you know, find what, what that is, whatever stimulus there is, whether it's in your mind or in your body and your nerves, figure out what that is. You know, maybe you're getting on Google and you're finding out how do I calm my anxious thoughts? How do I, you know, um, in the, in the scripture, I think it's in second Corinthians, it says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So that's telling us like when you've got these thoughts going crazy, it's your duty to like capture them, rein them in, not let them. It's like that old saying, birds can fly over your head, but don't let them build a nest in your hair. So I've never um, heard that. I love that. You, I bet it's from your dad. <laughs> right. <laughs> Probably. No, I don't know where it's from, but we, we have to take those thoughts and rein them in and, and, and what, what were some of the things that you did to take every thought captive when these thoughts came to you? Like, it's not going to get better. You're never going to get sleep. You'll never, now that you're broken, you'll never reach your dreams. Like, what were some of the things that you did when those thoughts would come? So many. <laughs> Again, I think it, it depends on what phase you're at, right? Yeah. So if you're in the cast phase, which was my denial phase, frankly, mm. I, um, like my, the adrenaline for me just really messed with my chemistry. So for mm. me, it wasn't until I ended up in the hospital and they were able to regulate my chemistry with medication that I had clear thoughts and could do like that self analysis of of being able to go, okay, well, what is causing this thought right now? Mm -hmm. You know, and then um, 
being okay with it and figuring that out. But I will say this. So this is one of my favorite stories. And I don't know how much time you usually spend on here. So I want to respect that. We usually go an hour, but I think today I will just go until we'll, we'll go. And if people need to get off, we understand they can watch the replay later, but I think okay, it's great. important. So let's just go. Okay, great. Then you just, you know, you're, you're my friend. This is, this is part of the awesome friendship too. Like, I would never take it personally if you were like, Jenna, we have to be done. You know what I mean? So 10 minutes ago. Come on. Be quiet. I know. I'm so sorry. Oh God. I'm not sorry though, because it is important. All right. Yeah. One of my favorite stories is, and I, I think you remember this. So when I first moved to LA, okay, backing up, Catherine and I grew up in Minnesota. And I don't know if this is a thing for you, but because Where nobody grew- shows emotions. When I'm reading your thing about we don't cry, I was like, yes, we do not show emotions. We are stoic Minnesotans. We don't. We oh, don't you show pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We are very yeah. proud of being a tough, tough, tough culture. Even right? if you're dying inside, literally. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I really hope you all read the book because I, I do think there's so much benefit in it. Um. Anyway, back to so speaking of books, we grew up really near Laura Ingalls Wilder's setting for Little House on the Prairie, right? Mankato was the town that they used to venture two days to go buy their supplies to. And both mm-hmm. Catherine and I grew up really close to Mankato. I got married in Mankato. There you go. I went to school there. So <laughs> growing up watching the series, because I'm a TV buff, which is so funny that I'm writing books. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I knew that they the, turn the into show, TV shows. <laughs> I mean, from your lips, right? Uh, I would love nothing more than this book to become a movie. Um, so, Reese Witherspoon, if you are watching, <laughs> send it to her. Um, Nail it to I, her. I have full intentions of doing that. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> anyway, I digress. So, like, Little House on the Prairie is based on books, right? And those books were based on journals. And so my whole life, I wanted to be like a journaler, right? Where like, when I pass, somebody will be able to read my entire life story. (laughs) Y'all, I cannot tell you how many journals I bought that had like three pages filled and nothing else. (laughs) Oh my gosh, because I'm a perfectionist. And a control freak. So I would buy the journal, which I love. I love journals so much. I would go to the store. I would pick out the perfect journal. It would be beautiful. I would sit down. I'd be like, I'm going to be like Laura Ingalls. And I'm going to write. And I would write for like three days. And then life would get in the way. And I wouldn't even look at the journal for like three months. Mm -hmm. And then you you can't pick up where you left off. You have to buy another journal. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yes. So, Not in my world. In my world, I could go a couple years no, without journaling. You're, journal. yeah. huh? you're like a full-on real journaler. I am, uh, I am not. <laughs> I really wanted to be. But I really, really am not. You guys, I can't. I'm, I'm that person who's like, oh, I did that. I don't need to relive it. Mm-hmm. It's why, like in film, it's a joke because my husband's in post production, and so he literally relives the the movie over and over and over again. And I'm like, I never want to see this again. Like, I I did it. I'm done. I'm good. Same thing with mm-hmm. podcasts. Like people people would be like, Oh, did you listen to that podcast that you were on? And I'm like, No, I was on it. Like, I I, I said the word anyway. It's a whole thing. So. Because I started to, or I didn't at the time, understand this about myself, um, I had a whole shelf in our tiny little apartment full of like journals with 10 page filled in. I would say there was at least 30. Wow. And each of them had maybe at the absolute most 20 pages filled in. And I had this desk in our living room because it was a tiny little apartment that was full of post-it notes. Full. Like, I mean, full. And my husband comes home one day and he's like, babe, I'm wondering if maybe you should write your to-do list in your journals. (laughs) 
you guys, it changed my life. Just looking at a journal from that perspective was mind blowing, right? And so for me to get out my anxiety, instead of journaling, I wrote my to-do list so that I knew like, okay, these are all the things that I wanna do. Mm -hmm. But then I also had a record of all the things I did. Mm. And it was kind of like the coolest thing ever. I can't even remember why this came up, but I think that that's the whole point is figuring out how you work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like if you need to journal to get your emotions out, that's one thing. But if you're having anxiety before you go to bed because something might fall through the cracks tomorrow, start doing a to-do list in that beautiful journal of yours. Mm-hmm. You know, well, you have a when Nif in the book, she she just wants to move on. She doesn't want to wallow anymore. What what do you find like what happens and how do you reconcile your mind wanting to move on when your body isn't ready and getting, you know, how did you get rid of that trapped like muscle memory from the trauma when like your mind just wants to get over, it, but your body's like, oh, no, we're we're stuck. We're staying here. What did, how did you deal with that? Hmm. Again, I think treating it like a broken bone. Yeah. You know, what is the hmm. therapy that will, that will work? The ice pack trick is a very physical um, way of getting trauma out. I actually started to go to um, somatic experiencing therapy and it, it was, that? so somatic experiencing is the idea. This is my layman definition, not a professional, Yeah, <laughs> but from what I experienced, it's like your body holds on to trauma, almost mm -hmm. like your subconscious. Mm hmm right so if you if we're talking about mental it's a subconscious if we're talking about physical that to me means um the somatic part it just means your oh, body your body's I holding on to the trauma i read a right? book on that mm -hmm. oh really so the book for, for any of you guys who are feel like you have trapped stuff trapped trauma in your body i highly recommend the book called healing trauma uh, by dr levine and Peter i did levine. two videos yeah, I did two videos on my YouTube channel talking about that book and some of the remedies. And it's really, you read that book? No, you know he's the, the one who invented the therapy that oh. I went to. Yeah, yeah he, he, and I've met him. Oh, I don't know. I don't think he knew what to do with me because I was so excited. Wow. I was like, you saved my life, right? And... Wow. He was, he's like the calmest. He's like, okay, whoa. Well, I don't know what to do with you and your excitement about trauma. Um, <laughs> trauma healing. Anyway, so yeah, Peter Levine, uh, somatic experiencing therapy. So I did 10 years of talk therapy and mm -hmm. I thought I was completely better. And I felt better than I had before, of course. And I was doing this uh, radio interview with this therapist. Her name is Dr. Shirley. She's awesome. And she, because she wanted to have me on to talk about trauma. And she's like, do you realize that every time you talk about trauma, your body goes like this? Every time you talk about the crash, your body, like, gets mm -hmm. out of the way. Like, moves and away. And I was, yep, because that's where it hit me. The car hit me. And so my body was holding on to this, like, experience and I had no idea. And so I, of course, immediately was like, how do we work together? And as we were working together, the technique is so incredible that like the trauma literally leaves your body mm. in the mm. most like logical way. Mm. Um, and there was a point where I would start to, I, I had started the therapy and I could feel the trauma go away and it would just be like a physical sobbing release of all of this energy. Mm. And then I would go on like walks with Craig and talk about the, the therapy session. And I'd be talking about this thing, this trauma that 
always for years had had a emotional, physical response. And I yeah. realized like I felt nothing. Wow. It was so bizarre. Wow. It was a really, really weird um, experience. But let me tell you, this is why I say there's a million different ways to heal. Somatic yeah. experiencing was perfect for my logical brain. Yeah. Right. Where talk therapy took a long time. Yeah. But uh, that might this, be different for someone else. That's yeah, that's true. But there's I think there is a a body response, the somatic there's a body response that we a lot of times don't pay attention to and we wanna gloss it over. And they talked about, you know, um animals in the wild, they experience like near death experiences on the regular. regular. <laughs> and they're not they're not traumatized like like mm -hmm. an antelope goes home like, wow, a bear just tried to eat me today, you know, and <laughs> they they still get up and they go about doing whatever they need to do each day. And the difference between how they respond to it and how we respond to it is they 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 go through it in their body and they shake it off. They he talked about this documentary where they they shot these darts into this polar bear and the polar bear went down a very traumatic experience. And when the polar bear came to, he didn't just like we do when we fall down, we just get up, brush it off. We're embarrassed. We hope nobody saw that we fell down. Oh, like we're going to pretend like everything's okay. Whereas when the polar bear comes to, he comes to, he's still laying there. And then his legs start running, his legs start running and his whole body like shakes it off. And, and their theory is what he's doing is he's going through it as if he got away and he didn't get mm, shot knocked down. So he's playing out what would have happened had it, had it not happened. And somehow that's able to work through the body. And, and, and in that book, Healing Trauma, they had so many great examples, like from a child falling and breaking his mm -hmm. chin open stitches and how, how you bring that back by replaying the scenario, but replaying it in a way as if you were successful, as if you got away. So this is just one of the many healing modalities that you could look into. Like Jenna said, she's tried over 60 or whatever. So, so a lot, y'all. <laughs> people are adjusting to this new reality after something has happened to them. What advice would you give someone after a traumatic experience or a tragedy or a loss of how they can like re-enter the quote unquote real world and come back to some sense of normalcy. Okay. I think one of the biggest roadblocks for me, and I feel like a lot of people is validation, mm. right? So we seek validation for something really personal from the outside. And like, I remember it when I was in this group therapy scenario, it was almost like people trying to one up. Oh yes. I've experienced right? that. Oh my gosh. Where you're just like, it's not a competition, right? Like if you are experiencing something that is making your life more difficult, that is valid and permission to work through it and get help and heal has to come from you because no one else is going to give it to you in the way that you need it, right? Like they may be like, oh yeah, you should probably see a therapist, but they're not going to be, most people I should say, are not going to be able to give you that like, true validation that you need. I mean, I hope this book gives you the validation that you need to understand that, like, if you're going through something that isn't making your life the way that you want it to be, that's your mm -hmm. choice to then acknowledge it and be like, you know what, this is not the life I want. What can I do to change it? And I think mm -hmm. that's the first piece is like not counting on others to validate your experience and what you need to create a different experience. Huge, huge. I cannot say it enough. The other thing is, um, 
committing to exploring options and finding the thing that works for you and not mm -hmm. judging yourself if the thing that you try doesn't work mm -hmm. and not judging the people around you for not being able to give you what you need because chances are they have no idea, mm -hmm. right? Like it's so important mm -hmm. to understand um, they're going through their own thing. It may not be as big Mm -hmm. on the outside as you as what you're going through but again that's comparison comparison is poison <laughs> not, so only that, that, not only that when we see people have gone through something horrific as opposed to someone who just had a little thing it it may not they may not have the tools so them handling the little thing is sometimes harder for them than someone else handling this horrific thing you know it has to 100%. do with their training what where they are mentally so it's it's yeah. it's you can't just poo poo or shove off. And I had that same experience in group therapy. I, I finally realized I needed someone to talk to about uh, the, the PTSD, the NICU stuff. And I went in this group therapy session and I was just crying and sobbing about what I was going through with Timothy and the different surgeries he had and blah, blah. blah. And it was almost like the mothers were like, that's nothing. My yeah. kid has six things wrong with them. Oh, my kid has 10 things. My kids had 19 brain surgeries. And I was so crushed. And I ended up like, I needed a healing, but I just felt so embarrassed. Like, wow, I shouldn't even be sad because my kid isn't as bad off as their kids. So I should just, I should just be grateful. And I should, you know, yeah. and I, I just was like, I guess I can't talk about it because it's not as bad as their thing, you know, and I just, right. Just, up and didn't want to talk oh. about it to anybody. It's such a common experience and it makes me so sad. And so if, if you can leave this conversation with anything, it would be, I feel like we all need to figure out and you know, it's a, it's a daily process y'all like different experiences require you to be thinking in different ways. Right. Which is why the toolbox is so important. But if we can all figure out how to validate our own human experience, mm -hmm. I think the world would be a totally different place, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but I, I really do think it all comes down to validation. And um, so I would start there and mm -hmm. I would just, um, I would read the book <laughs> to be honest, because there's so many ways to start. Like I really tried to, weave the story in with helpful tips. So it's almost yeah. like a self-help book, but in a fiction setting. Um, but I did want to before, because I know we're, we're getting to the end here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about, is it Vias? The, yes. um, their question about dealing with condescending authority. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, mm. I, I definitely want to address that because I feel like there's a certain amount of self protection that we have to give um, when we're going through trauma or any life, right? Like, like you said earlier, we can't tell everybody everything. And so I, I, I'm obviously don't have a ton of clear, like, context to dealing with this but like if it's a parent if it's a teacher um again i would i i feel like it's really important for us to give our own validation and i have two stories to exemplify this one i was giving a speech at a um youth leadership to high school students. It was really cool too, because they broke up into, um, after the speech, we broke up into smaller groups and wrote like all these challenges on the wall and had discussions about it. And one of the students was talking about um, her dad really liked to use the word phase and it felt really condescending to her. And I was like, I thought about it for, ever afterwards. I mean, this was like four years ago. And as I still think is, about it. As in this is just a phase you're going through? Yes. Okay. Yes. She mm -hmm. was dealing with um, 
pretty severe depression from what it sounded like. But instead of like getting his kid help, he would just say, oh, it's just a phase you're going through. It's just a phase you're going through. And I feel like two things. One, yeah, maybe. And we all go through phases. And I feel like it's up to us to start to kind of embrace the idea that it's a phase, but it's a phase that you may need help getting through, right? Yeah. So like if we use the term like, oh, it's just a phase to brush it off, that's where the problem comes from, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like for us individually, there's a lot of like self um, acceptance and self, what's the word I'm looking for, Catherine? Like we have a choice in the matter, mm -hmm. you know, um, what's what a responsibility. I love the term radical responsibility. <laughs> it's like, we have to be like, you know what, this is my life. And yes, mm -hmm. I may have to, you know, deal with my teachers because I'm still in high school or deal with being in a small town because I don't have my driver's license yet or deal with my parents because I'm under 18, like all these things that you're having to go through, but how you deal with them is up to you, mm -hmm. right? How much energy, it's almost like choosing your battles. So if this person, back to the question, how do you deal with authority figures who tell other people that they won't be able to bounce back from an obstacle that they're dealing with? It's up to you to decide whether that's true or not, mm -hmm. right? Like it's up to you to believe it and it's not up to you to convince them that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. You can just start to be like, mm, okay, if that's how you feel, but I'm going to be aggressively optimistic and not yeah. believe that. Right. Yeah. And I have, I have this one story that I love to tell so much. It includes an F word, but I will try very hard not to say it. So I was giving a speech to, um, this group of high school students and we broke up into smaller sessions, which I always love. And there was this kid, like it was the middle of Hollywood. You guys, you have to understand for Catherine and I, Hollywood is like the place that we worked our butts off our entire lives to get to. So here I am in this like Mecca, right? I'm like living in this space of open mindedness and creativity and just all the, all the things. And um, this speech was at a high school in the middle of Hollywood. Again, Hollywood. And there's this kid in the group and we're all chatting and he's really quiet off in the corner. And he's like, got dark eyeliner. Like you can tell he has this like artist soul, right? But he's very guarded and he's got like spikes on his jacket and like all this stuff. And he, like towards the end, we're getting to the end of our conversation. And he like slowly, timidly raises his hand. And he goes, he asks basically the question that um, uh, Vias is asking. He, he goes, what do you do if no one believes in you? Mm. Oh, right? I'm like, I grew up in a town with 2006 people. And every single day, someone told me I couldn't do what I wanted to do every day. But mm -hmm. I didn't have the ability to make friends with people outside of this town or surround myself with people who had the same ideas I did. And here I am in Hollywood, where I've now created friendships like Catherine's where we're all like super supportive of each other. And like, yeah, go after your dream, do the thing, right? And here's this kid who literally goes to school in Hollywood feeling what I felt in this tiny town in Minnesota. And I, it broke my heart, you guys. But I literally looked at him and I'm like, you tell them to F off. Like, you have to not listen to them, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I felt so bad. But I also was like, I was so like emotional about it because I yeah. had this realization that it doesn't matter where you are physically if you don't understand that you have a choice. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. if you're 
your only belief is that, well, these are the people I'm surrounded by and they're my influence and that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, so I would suggest for going back to the question of how do you surround yourself with that friend group? You, you join groups like Catherine's, you get into coaching programs, you get into business programs, you get into like program, not programs, but like Facebook groups, YouTube, social media, like all of these things that we typically think can be toxic. Like my social media is the most inspiring social media ever because I've curated it that way. Mm -hmm. I only follow people who are supportive. I only mm -hmm. follow people who give good advice, you know, who post inspiring things, but aren't mm -hmm. toxic. Um, mm -hmm. And so we do have the ability to surround ourselves, even if we're in a tiny town now with technology, with people mm -hmm. who think the way that we think. So in conclusion, uh, bias, I hope I'm saying that right. Don't listen to them. Yeah. Don't listen to them. Find people who think like Catherine and I do, who will encourage the healing process. They we exist. <laughs> we exist. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, yeah. So I So um <laughs> I did I did want to ask when when you go through something traumatic, you had these dreams, you came to move to Hollywood. Uh, Nif wanted to be a singer. You wanted to be an actor. Does does going through something like this, obviously, it's kind of, in some ways, you have a lot of downtime to think. Did that shift or change or move what you wanted to be? Because it went from, like, actor to producer to, like, speech to speaker to author. Like, are, is, is it, in some ways, was that like a good time for you to like reevaluate what was really important to you? And how did you, when you did decide to maybe pivot into something else, how did you shake off any feeling of like shame or being a loser? Cause you're thinking, Oh, I told all these people I'm moving to Hollywood to be an actor and now I'm not acting. Cause I know that is a lot of it too, with small town stuff like, yeah. Oh, now I'm a failure. Cause I didn't do what I came out here to do. So that was a big, long, lots of questions, but take a step. No, I love it. it. I love it. And honestly, I wish I could say I did it with grace. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. There was a lot of internal anger that I had to like process through um, on two sides, right? Like I have this firm belief that I can do whatever I want with my life. And I still believe that. I think I had to come to the conclusion that it would not be in my time frame. And it might look different mm -hmm. from what I originally set out to do. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that in the book too. That's what um, Nif's kind of pivot, she pivots from one dream to another. And I think I had to come I, I really did have a lot of like thinking. I don't know that it was during my healing process, to be honest with you, because I I couldn't <laughs> like physically have thoughts like that um, for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. But once I did like get to a point where I was reevaluating and I do this very often because I love to try new things. I realized mm -hmm. the reason I wanted to be an actor was so that I could have a platform to share these messages, right? Yeah. Like all of yeah. the stuff that I wanted to act in was empowering. All of the, the um, things that I wanted to produce were empowering. So it was like, there's this deep desire for me to share stories that empower people to overcome whatever obstacles in front of them. So I just started to sit down and go, okay, well, how can I do that now? Right? Because at the time when I was acting, you know, I had just done Buffy. And it was like this huge thing where I thought my whole life is going to, like my dreams are coming true, all that thing, all the things, but I couldn't read. I stuttered when I talked, I would forget basic words. There was no way that I physically could do the job of an actor 
Mm -hmm. And then I Mm -hmm. ended up going into producing, which, you know, is basically what I do now. So it, it's just the how of the dream changed for me. Yeah. And I think it does for a lot of people and not to feel Mm -hmm. bad or shame or condemnation because it's really about the destination and not the vehicle that you took to get there. So you want to tell empowering stories that, that help people, whether you're telling that as an actor or a writer or a speaker or a producer, that's still the same end goal. And so for those of you who are like, well, gosh, this thing that I wanted to do, like I wanted to be a ballerina, but now I'm, you know, 50 and 300 pounds. I can't be a ballerina necessarily in a whatever. But what did you like about the thought about wanting to be a ballerina? Was it the art? Was it the beauty? Was it the, you know, and just start to ask yourself for those of you who think it's too late for you or you can't do your dreams or because you're so locked into it, having to look a certain way, start to really ask yourself, what was it about that thing? And this, this happened to me when I just only saw myself as a poet and I had this life coach mm. and he said to me, well, what, what is it that you like about the poetry so much? Like why? Cause he was trying to encourage me to write like a regular book with sentences that didn't rhyme. And I just <laughs> could never see myself doing that. <clears throat> and I was like, well, you know, I love, I, I, I it's crazy because I didn't say anything about the meter, the rhyme, the scansion, like the, the poetry stuff. I was like, well, I love how it makes people feel. And I love the this and that and like, and, oh, and, and it changes people and it makes them think different. And, and it struck me, he goes, well, don't you think you have more to say on that topic then? And I was like, then that book with like 20 poems, I go, nope, that's everything I've wanted to say on the topic. And then he challenged me. <clears throat> He's like, well, if someone gives me a two line quote, I could talk about it for an hour. I'm like, how could you do that? I said everything I wanted to say. So he challenged me and it was almost like the next day, the Holy Spirit started waking me up at three or four in the morning. (laughs) And I started going through my little book of 20 poems. And every day I would just write for like an hour or two, just based on. And at the end of like 40 days, I ended up having enough material, not only for the You Are Worthy book, the next book and like for the next like five or six books, I had enough material for my next five books that I got from 20 little lines of poetry, just from like thinking about it. So I think right. sometimes we giving do all permission. Stuff. Yeah. Giving myself permission. So I was like, Oh wow. That one little, you know, I hired him to coach me for something completely different. And we did the 12 <laughs> sessions that. on these all topics. And I was like, I don't want to talk about this. And it was just that one little piece of advice that changed my whole trajectory. So my book, You Are Worthy, came out last year. And I wanted to touch on that because one of the things you said was you didn't feel worthy of getting help with what you were doing. So how did you overcome that hurdle to go, gosh, you know, how, how how does one become worthy of getting the help that they need. (laughs) I mean, oh, that's a great question. That's a great question, (laughs) right? Is it just a decision that you make? I really think it is just a decision you make. I Mm -hmm. feel like it's just, I think for me, because it got to such a point with the, you know, like literally almost taking a whole bottle of sleeping pills that I, I had to be like, do I want this to be my life forever? And if the answer is no, then I have to give myself permission to go and get the help, whether I felt worthy at the time or not. Yeah. But again, that goes back to how I work is much more logical than I was allowing myself to be because this was a very emotional type of situation. Right. And so um, I really think it's up to us individually to give ourselves permission to get the help to um, create the life that we want and 
figure out what motivates us to do that, right? Like for me, it was, I didn't want to be a burden on my friends anymore. So it wasn't even necessarily an internal, like, I don't like this. But like, there was that one piece where I was like, I cannot keep doing this to the people I love. How do I get help so that I'm not a burden? That kind of thing. Like understanding how, which is not true. I understand I'm not a burden, but you know, like that's how my brain was working. So instead of fighting how my brain works, I decided to work with it and focused on a goal, meaning my goal is to get better. Everything else is ancillary, right? I also wanted to go back to what what you were talking about with the um, acting, producing, writing your book. I love that story. I think it's really important. We can all like it that this has been something I've been saying for a couple of years now. So it's pretty new for me too, but I can do all the things. Mm -hmm. Like we pigeonhole ourselves so much, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when we first came to LA and I was like, I'm so guilty of this. I was like, well, if you're going to be an actor, you just be an actor, right? Otherwise mm -hmm. people aren't going to see you as an actor. There's mm -hmm. some truth to that, but mm -hmm. also like, <clears throat> it stopped me from, you know, being a page at Warner Brothers, which would have been a really fun experience or like it stopped me from having a lot of fun experiences. And I feel like so happy that I wrote this book in the way that I wanted to write it because mm -hmm. for years I was like, well, you can't, you can't be an author in this way because X, Y, Z until mm -hmm. I started to say like, you can do all the things and you mm -hmm. can have all the emotions at the same time. Yeah. Right. My grandma passed last week, two days before I became a number one best selling author. And then I went to Minnesota two days after that for the funeral. I mean, the emotions that I was feeling last week were like, mm -hmm. an old me would have been like, I'm not going to celebrate my authorship because it's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, new me is like, you can be sad and happy at the same time. Like it, it both can exist at the same time. And my grandma was so excited about my book. So if, if, if she knew I was belittling this accomplishment because she had passed, she would have like rose from the dead and come and like, gave me a talking to. So mm -hmm. like, it's that thing where I, I was sad and happy at the same time and it was exhausting, but that's life, right? Yeah. Like we can't keep pigeonholing our jobs, our dreams, our thoughts and emotions, you know? And you're worthy of celebrating and you're worthy of getting help. And if we don't celebrate ourselves, like, what is that saying even to the people around us? And like, like you said, your grandma, there's people who've been yeah. fighting for us and cheering for us and wanting us. And when we poo poo, like, Oh, it's, you know, it's just whatever. I finally put a book out. Cause I see myself doing that. I'm like, yeah, okay. I did a book. And, and then I don't talk about it. my first three books I published. I, know. I, never, I never told a soul. I never even sent out an email. I never told anybody the first three books I did. I never even let anyone know I wrote a book. <laughs> like, what is that? That's that whole I unworthiness. What? I understand. I, I didn't tell anyone I was writing the book because I did. Honestly, I didn't think I was going to finish. Hmm. Right. And so I understand that. And I feel like we have to give ourselves grace for like, sometimes I'm like, oh, what would have happened if I had been promoting this for the like, whole year that I was writing it, but I didn't. And that's okay. It is what yeah. it is. Right. Yeah. But, but yes, we are worthy. We need to give ourselves permission to live this beautiful life the way that we want to live it. As long as we're not hurting anybody else. Right. That's always mm -hmm. the disclaimer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, do the things y'all do, the, do things. the things. And they may not look the way that you want thought they were going to look not even want them to look 
but yeah. thought they were going to look. Like mm -hmm. my dream when I came to LA, my whole life, honestly, from three years old, my dream was to be an actor. But the reality is my dream was to be an actor so I could have conversations like this. Yeah. Living yeah. my dream right now. It looks very different from what yeah. I thought it was going to be when I was a kid. But mm -hmm. this is it. You yeah. know? And so, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Hold up your book again. Everyone, if you go to any of your local bookstores, you can get a copy of Aggressive Optimism. You can, you know, see what Niff's character went through, aka what Jenna went through, and how she navigated those tough storms. And uh, where can people find you if they want to look oh. you up? I am quite active on Instagram, which I love. It's my favorite platform. So let me just put my, it's Jenna Edwards official. It's a lot of yellow. So if you don't like yellow, probably, probably not your jam. Um, <laughs> Maybe they but, can get past um, their aversion to yellow to get the good content. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Instagram, I put it in the YouTube chat, um, which I'm going to go through and try and answer everyone's questions as well. Um, but I did want to say really quickly, when you're reading the book, there is a villain. Her name is Jessa. She is based on probably like 30 people, mostly my internal mean girl. So <laughs> anybody who's reading it, who mm. I may have grown up with, who thinks they know who it is, you do not know who it is. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's the that challenge of art. Yes, aggressive optimism. Okay, so Jenna, if, if we if we missed any questions, she said she's going to go through and answer them individually. So yes. and they know where to find you. Thank you for gracing us with your time. And I hope you guys were oh blessed God. by this conversation. And like Jenna says, I can do all the things. We have that Philippians 4.13 in our scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever you guys have been through, just know that there's healing on the other end. Jenna is a wonderful testament of coming through something that people told her she'd never get through and living her dreams, doing all the things despite what anyone has told them. So if you need to tell them to go leave you alone with their negativity, mm -hmm. you do what you got to do to protect your peace and keep that aggressive optimism. All right, love oh, you guys. Love Thank you, Jenna, and we'll see the rest Thank of you guys you. next week. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.